It's taking a minute. Oh, we're live. Good afternoon and welcome to Story Strategy Live from Evident Inc. We've got Nancy and Don here today to talk about building your blurb. Hi, Don. Hi. How are you doing? I'm toasty. It is toasty. warm here. Yeah. It's so weird here. I, I'm used to summer being hot, but in Colorado, it's like hot for a minute and then it's actually cold and then the wind blows a lot and then we have thunderstorms and then it's hot again. It's very weird. I like it. No, it's just 103. That's I mean, how, yeah. I like I mean, California that's, was like that. <laughs> the wind blows, but it feels like you're standing in front of a hair dryer. So it's yeah. not like, you know, comforting in any way. So, yeah. No, I've been pleasantly surprised. But what's funny, I think you just get used to wherever you live because I was out on the street this morning with the dog. Um, I don't normally just stand out on the street. In the <laughs> And one of the neighbors walked by and was like, she was like, how are you doing? And I was like, oh, it's, you know, I'm good. And she's like, oh, this weather. And I was like, I know it's so weird. And she was like, no, it's so hot. And I was like, but no, <laughs> it's not actually. Oh, very relative. <laughs> yeah. Very, very relative. <laughs> Whatever you say, lady, but you're wrong. <laughs> uh, so what's going on in your world? Oh, um, so Friday after we had our last story strategy thing, I had the pleasure of sitting through a five hour Zoom parent orientation for my daughter's college. Ooh, I bet you're real oriented now. That's a long time. It, yes, yes. And nothing, I mean, the, these poor kids, these poor college kids that were leading that, they were trying so hard and bless it their was hearts. being because, led by kids? Right. It's a live, oh, like, this is what, if we had been able to go down to her school, she would have spent two days there. They have separate sessions for the parents and for the students. She would have stayed the night in the dorms. It's supposed to be a whole big thing. Yeah. So picture all of the really like rah, rah, come to our school type students and they're trapped in a Zoom call this big. Oh, no. And they're, um, they tried to start it off like they would have the normal thing where everybody would have been all together. So all the parents and all the students were on the same Zoom link. And then they're like, okay, students, you have this link over here. Parents, you're going to hang out with us and learn all about this. And you wouldn't have thought that was hard instructions. Yeah. But of course they had the kids who were, you know, would like unmute themselves and turn on their camera and be like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Oh gosh. And, <laughs> and I was, I was doing fine, except for they, you know, after they got them all taken care of, they pop back onto us and they're like, um, okay. So we want this to be like the normal experience. So I, we want everybody to turn on their cameras and I'm like, Oh no, hard pass. Cause oh my um, gosh. I'm going to be doing five hours. stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then we had the one dude who didn't realize like how a Zoom call works. So he thought they were talking only to him. Oh, well, that's fun. So he turns on his camera and his microphone and he's like, hey, am I late? <laughs> and they're like, no. And he's like, okay, well, I've got some other stuff I got to do. So is it all right if I just work while y'all are talking? I mean, I'll still listen. And if oh you need me to answer anything... You know, but I got some stuff I got to do. And they're like, and he's like, are there any other parents here? Oh, my gosh. And they're, and they're like, yeah, there's about 45 other parents on this call. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, and, well, and I will tell you. Where, super fun. The, the, the part where they finally lost me, where I was finally like, I'm really questioning whether or not I should send my child and my money to the school. <laughs> if the... Um, I guess she's the president of the university, the outgoing president or the incoming president, I'm not sure, um, comes, came on to do a little speech. And I don't know if you remember way, way back when quarantine started and they talked about, everybody was watching the Tiger King. Yeah. I don't know if you ever watched the Tiger King. Try real hard not to. Okay, so the Tiger King's ne nemesis was this woman named Carol Baskins. Yeah that um, I've been told I sound like, and I'm not sure how I feel like that, <laughs> how I feel about that. But her thing, she still has like a YouTube channel and her thing when she starts her YouTube channel 
is she starts off with, hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Uh-huh. And um, the college that my daughter is going to, the uh, mascot is a bear cat. Yeah. And so the president of the university started off her speech with, hey, all you cool cats and bear kittens. And I was like, no, nah, I'm out. No. Oh, no. <laughs> well, this, I'm really questioning some decisions right now. <laughs> this actually feeds directly into what we're going to talk about today which is because what she did was a little bit of sales copy there that somebody should have <laughs> really somebody had should her have edited that for her. her. Yeah. <laughs> like, is this really how you want to represent yourself <laughs> and right. your product? Because maybe not. So well, that good. is I'm exactly what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Oh, hi, Susan. Hi, Laura. So today we're going to talk about building blurbs, which everybody most um, writers are not super excited about unless they're copywriters um, because it really is writing a blurb is sales, right? The blurb appears on your sales page at Amazon and the other retailers. And so your goal in writing that is for it to sell your book so that because you can't stand there and tell everybody what it's all about. Um, that's your kind of like your voice. You usually, you don't probably want it to be your voice, but we'll get into more details about that. So why, um, why do you think everyone hates writing blurbs so much? I think because it is taking thousands and thousands of words in this grand world you've created and all these amazing characters and squishing them. Yeah. And so I, you see all of these authors who they can write entire books and then you're like, okay, so tell me about that in 300 words or less. And I am one of them who are like, we all know 300 words is way too too few words for me to do anything, but yeah, that's just not, not my, not my skill. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think even if it's your book, sometimes it's harder to, to do that, to be able to distill down the main points because you're like, but this is important and this is important too, but yes, then you can't talk about this. Like this. Yeah. Because I find writing my own blurbs to be much more difficult than writing blurbs for other people. Um, Susan says, I'm never sure how much or how little to put in the blurb. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today um, because everybody struggles with that. And when you've written 75,000 words, 100,000 words, it is hard to decide out of that what's important. What is what is the story really about? What are readers going to care about? What's going to make them click on that buy button? So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here today. Yes. And Susan is very brave because she has volunteered to be our tribute. Yay! I wasn't sure anyone was gonna jump on that because I just threw out that offer about, I don't know, 45 minutes ago. Thank you, Susan. So, yes, we're, we're going to live review her blurb early in a little bit. So. Oh, awesome. So uh, is that in my email then? It should be. Yes, I see it. Awesome, okay. Perfect. So we'll do that. We'll go through um, the things that we're going to talk about on blurbs first, and then we'll look at Susan's blurb. Very exciting. Okay. <laughs> All so right. <clears throat> types of blurbs, what do we need? Well, so I think there's really, I, there's probably a million, but I'm going to narrow it down into two, two types of blurbs or three, really. What do I have here? Three. Yeah. And one is nonfiction. So that's sort of its own category. We'll get there in a second. But um, for fiction books, you, you, you're kind of choosing between two. One is basically like a story preview kind of blurb. Um, so that's going to give you a quick taste of what you're going to get when you read the book. So preview, right? Um, I pulled an example because I think, I think examples of good blurbs is the best way to mm -hmm. kind of demonstrate what's working and what's not working. So I pulled The Maze Runner. And hopefully most people are familiar with that story, kind of know what it's about. But even if you're not, you'll. this is a good example of a story preview. So this book is by James Dashner. And here's the blurb. It's pretty short. When Thomas wakes up in the lift, the only thing he can remember is his name. He's surrounded by strangers, boys whose memories are also gone. Outside the towering stone walls that surround them is a limitless, ever-changing maze. It's the only way out. And no one's ever made it through alive. Then a girl arrives, the first girl ever. And the message she delivers is terrifying. Remember, survive, run. And that's the whole blurb. 
So if you I love the movie, that. <laughs> yeah. And so you have you seen the movie, read the book? I have seen the movie and I'll comment on the movie after you discuss the blurb a little bit. Okay. Well, we read the book first. Um, I try to read with my boys, even though they're older than most people read to at this point, but we always try to have a book that we're working on together. And then Maze Runner was one of the books that we read together. So, and I've also seen the movies, but it, it, A, it's an awesome concept. It's just mm -hmm. like something that somebody was like, what if, and then they wrote this book about it and it was amazing. Um, but the blurb pretty much gives you everything you need to know without giving anything away. And that's a great example of a story preview because it also shows you sort of the way the book is written, like the, the tense voice, the choppy sentences mm -hmm. at the end. Um, we talked about dialogue and pacing last week. And I think it was last week. Yes, dialogue was last week. Yeah. And this is kind of a good example of how you can use language to to provide the tension that your story is going to, to have in it. Yes. I will tell you when we watched the movie, we had not read the books. And when we watched the movie, uh, when I watched it with my kids, we did not realize it was the first in a, a trilogy, I guess. Yeah. And so when it ended, my son went, huh? It's <laughs> like they went, well, it's over. Good luck figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it and does. Never, it just kind of ends because there's other movies, but we've never seen the other movies. Well, and the book is less of a cliffhanger, I think, than the movie is. But it, I mean, it ends the same way. You just get a little bit more like tidy wrap up because he can, you know, give you that language. But the point of a blurb is to make somebody one click, right? Yes. And this one, I think makes you ask a lot of questions, right? Like, mm -hmm. well, I don't understand why are his memories gone? What are, who are these other boys? Why are they living among these towering stone walls? What's the deal with the maze? And then the girl arrives. And so you're like, just what? And if you're the kind of person that's into dystopian, sci-fi, whatever we want to categorize this as, odds are pretty good. You're probably going to one click that book, right? Mm -hmm. So because a lot of us write romance, we have some other options. And honestly, a story preview blurb for romance is probably not the best way to go. I did look for examples, but I didn't find one that I really liked. Um, what you tend to find, I think because, and you're the, the story coach here, so correct me, sci-fi fantasy, that kind of stuff tends to be more plot driven, right? Yes, yes. And I was, after you talk about your next part here, then I wanted to point something out about that. Okay. Okay, then I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that for you because my next point is that in romance the blurbs, much like the books, I think, are very character focused. Um, yes. So we usually get an introduction of either one or both main characters in a romance blurb. So I chose one that I think uses um, is pretty effective. It's from Lauren Landish. It's a book called Rough Love. Um, it's a little bit longer, so I'm gonna try not to drone too much here, but I think it's a good example. So it starts with kind of a hooky tagline. It says, second chances aren't easy. Sometimes it takes some rough love. Um, so you know right off the bat that you're getting a tropey second chance romance um, and rough love because it has a cowboy on the cover tells me we're talking about like a Western. Um, then it says, Bruce Tannen is known as brutal with a capital B, from his days as a monster on the football field. But now he's a farmhand on what used to be his family's land and change is all around him. New family, new expectations, new friends. It's all fine by him until he runs into the one woman to ever hold his heart. Allison left him a lifetime ago, but she's the only thing that's ever felt right in his arms, in his heart, and in his life. Something's different though. She's a shadow of her former self and he wonders what could have dulled her shine. He can help her fight her demons and bring back her sunny smile, but should he? So I'm not gonna read the whole thing because then it switches to Allison kind of and, and gives a similar background kind of lead into the story from her perspective. But this gives you a great idea of how to do the dual POV, which is basically setting up your character goal motivation conflict so that readers and romance readers like to know what they're getting. Um, yes, they know definitely. exactly what they're getting, right? Well, and the point I was going to make about the two different um, types of the blurbs, the story preview versus the character driven. Um, I, of course, 
I love romance and I do read romance and I do edit romance. My first love is mysteries, thrillers, and that kind of thing. So when it comes to me picking up a book with a that's a mystery or a thriller, I want that preview of the story. I, I'll get to know the characters as we're going through. Tell me what's going on. Give me a puzzle to solve. Draw me in. Um, with the romance, it's exactly what you said. The, it's much more character driven and it's much more, okay, I want to know if I'm going to want to hang out with these people for any amount of time. Because, right. you know, I'm stuck with these two, basically, to where also with a sci-fi or a fantasy, usually there's multiple characters, there's multiple world building going on, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think you did a great job picking both of those to kind of contrast each other. Mm -hmm. Thank the, you. One, the one <laughs> thing that I was going to point out, because you didn't read it, is... Uh, Romance, uh, there's a trend, I guess, with romance blurbs to always end with a question. Yeah. And I think you have to be very careful how you phrase that question. Because sometimes the question, I'm like, when it, the question is phrased something like, um, and I I don't have my glasses on and I can't read what that says, but the, question, read the question at the end of this. Hold on. I, will, I didn't, I will I didn't read, read, read the whole thing. Okay. Yes. Let's see. Can Bruce open his heart to the one that shattered it in the first place? And can Allison blend who she is now with who she used to be and live happily ever after and live the happily ever after she should have? Um, complete personal preference. But, and that one's done very, really well. But sometimes on the romance blurbs, the question is so obvious that you're like, well, it's a romance. Of course, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you know it's going to be a happily ever after. So you're right. like, can he score the one woman who slipped away? You're like, well, right. yeah, that's yes. why I'm reading this book. <laughs> he better, or I'm going to end up throwing this book across the room and not recommending it to any of my friends. Right. But that The way that's phrased is much better because it's in their conflict. The conflict yes. is, He's got to decide if he's going to open up his heart to this woman who shattered his heart before. And she's got to decide if she can let herself live the happily ever after she was supposed to have. And so that's showing their conflict. So when you're reading some of these blurbs or when you're writing the blurb, you want to be sure it's that the, the question, and I'm not saying don't ever end your blurb in a question. That's not my point. I want The question needs to be something that's not obvious. Yeah, I agree with that. But ending on a question, Susan, because Susan wrote, oh, crap, I have a question in my blurb. Um, no, is question actually okay. recommended. Yeah. Yes. It's, yes. It's, it's a pretty good practice to end with a question that the reader is going to want answered. So right. Roman and I think readers, that's you want a happy ever after. So uh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't necessarily serve its purpose as a sales tool. If you ask a super obvious question, they don't right. have to buy the book to find out. Yes. And, the, and, the, and that was, that's my, my point there is not that you shouldn't add a question. I know questions are the trend right now. And um, the question needs to be a question, like you just said, that the reader wants an answer to not what they already know the answer to. Right. And like so how if, will she choose between a kangaroo and a wombat, that, that sort of right. thing. Like, yes. Don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe that's only in my books. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and then we also should pay attention to the nonfiction blurb because it works a little bit differently. And yes. um, we do actually edit nonfiction at Evident Inc. Um, not nearly as much, but I come from a business background and I was a copywriter before I was anything else. Um, so we do get some, some nonfiction clients. So um, I chose a... I chose a, like m how to make money kind of um, nonfiction blurb because there's so many of these books out there. But the nonfiction version of a blurb is kind of what will you learn from me? That's what I want right. my blurb to tell you. Like, what is it that I'm going to tell you in this book that you cannot live without? So this one was from Secrets of Self-Made Millionaires by Matthew Cratter. Um, and it's if you like questions, here we go. Tired of living from paycheck to paycheck, ready to start finally building wealth? Your roadmap is here. Discover the different paths that ordinary people took to become self-made millionaires. These are not trust fund babies. They are regular folks just like you and me. The only difference is that every day they took another step down the path of wealth, daily action, and the right kind of action. That's all it takes to become a self-made millionaire. 
in this book, you will learn about dot, dot, dot. And it goes on. Um, but there's so many things that are working in this blurb um, mm -hmm. because it appeals to all the things that make people buy. Um, ordinary people, just like you and me, have done this. That means I can do it too, right? Um, there's secrets and a roadmap. Like, I'm going to know what these things are, and he's going to show me exactly how to do it. It's very compelling, right? And I, I mean, Prior to knowing that this book existed, I hadn't thought I was looking for a book about how to become a self-made millionaire, but I was like, maybe I should buy that book. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it also presents the problem that you're having, mm -hmm. that you're living tired of paycheck living to paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, and that you're ready to start building some wealth. So it's like, hey, here's your problem. I can fix it. Right. And so it presents that right up front for you. And it uses the you word instead of the I word. Um, in mm -hmm. nonfiction, you're the expert. That's why you've written this book. But you don't want your blurb to be talking all about you. You want to tell the reader. It's it's that features benefit question, right? You don't want to tell them all the features of your book. You want to explain how it's going to benefit them. So you use you language instead of I language. So this was, I thought, a very good blurb for a nonfiction book. So how do you know which kind is right for your book? So how do you choose, Dawn? Well, you got to start with genre. You yeah. got to know, like, like I was just saying, when I pick up a thriller and I'm reading the, the copy on it, I want to know what adventure are we going on? Same thing when I pick up a fantasy or a, a, a sci-fi is we're going on an adventure. I want to go on the adventure. And then when you pick up something like a romance or a women's fiction, then it's more, this is the character. This is the person who's going to sit down with you and tell you the story. Right. And um, I heard a, a quote once that every romance is basically how I met your mother. But it's, <laughs> it's every romance story is the story of how I met your mother. And so it's like, okay, do I want to listen to this guy tell me the story for 300 pages of how he right. met my mother? Yeah. So. That makes sense because when you're reading a romance blurb, you're basically deciding like, would I sit down and have a drink with this person? Like, do I want to hang out with them? Um, do I relate to them basically? Um, well, so one way to figure out what you want to, to put in your blurb is to look at the books that you think are competitive to yours. Um, and they will just a very quick side note here. Um, if you think that your book has no competitors, then, we have a different conversation to have because <laughs> that's not actually a good thing. <laughs> no, no. Um, it will make your life very difficult. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of blurb you write then, but you want to look at the books that are doing well in the categories that you expect to market your own work in and really study them. How are they formatted? Meaning like, is it a story preview? Is it a character driven blurb? Does it end with a question? Is there a hook at the beginning? Um, is it long? Is it short? Are the sentences short and snappy? Are there two characters talking? All of that stuff. You want to kind of start assimilating like, okay, so nine out of 10 are dual POV. I would say then you should probably write a dual POV ver uh, blurb. And when, so Evident Inc. does do blurb work for clients um, and lots of other companies do too. And so when we ask for you know, information, what, what are we going to write this blurb about? What book are we looking at? That's one of the first things that we ask is what what genre are you writing in? What books would you consider comparable? Um, and then I would also recommend, you know, don't look at a book that was doing really well five years ago. If right. The author, it changes. Yeah. If the author's savvy or if their publishing company is pretty, pretty quick, then it may be a brand new blurb and different than what it was five years ago. But if specifically if it's a traditionally published book and it's older, don't use that blurb as an example because you said questions are hot right now. They probably weren't hot three years ago. Well, and the language changes. I mean, everybody knows that the language changes, but certain, um, what am I looking for? Keywords are going to change. Certain conflicts are going to be uh, more trendy than others. So if you have this kind of conflict right now that, but you know, 10 years ago, that's something that somebody wouldn't have mentioned. You want to be sure you're looking at something that's up to date. Right. Definitely. And there's different things that you might highlight from the same story, depending on where we are in time. 
Right. Um, what so else? you you just uh, listed off a whole bunch of things when you were saying when you're looking at the blurb, look for this, 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 and this. So kind of break those down for us a little bit. What what should a good blurb have? Okay. Well, so right off the bat, it should have a hook. The very first thing that it says should be something that makes you go, oh, like I will now read the next sentence of the blurb because that is so interesting. <laughs> so, you have drawn me in. Yes. It can be a ludicrous statement like Jenny Olson always hated cake or, you know, it's just something <laughs> stupid or, um, you know, Roger never believed that his future wife would be standing in the middle of a museum surrounded by wombats. I don't know. It just... <laughs> It could be a ridiculous statement that makes you go, oh, okay, what is this book about? Or yeah, what are we, where are we going? <laughs> um, or it could be a question. Um, it's something that, you know, like what if your worst enemy was your perfect match according to a dating site or something like that? Um, something that makes you go, huh, okay, I'm going to read more about that. So that's the hook. And that's the very first thing that you want. And then the next the next two to four sentences probably are the part where you get to kind of tell them what the story is about. And this is where most people really struggle because you don't want to tell them everything and they don't need to know about 13 different characters that they're going to meet. And in fact, they they will quickly get confused and be like, okay, no, thank you. Um, you want to stay as tightly focused as you can to the main story thread. And you may have 16 subplots, but this is not where we're going to talk about them at all. Um, whatever the most compelling story thread is, is the one that you're going to focus on. Um, and just give them a very quick sort of preview of both the tone of the book. So if you used a funny, lighthearted voice in when writing the book, you're going to use that for the blurb as well. If it's a hard-hitting thriller, you don't want your blurb to be light and fun, right? Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm just yes, thinking. you want to be sure you're following through on the promise of the reader expectation of the genre and the promise of the premise of if I'm reading the back of the book and the book has a certain feel to it, when you open it, it's going to that feel should match. And um, I won't name the book, but I will tell you that a friend of mine sent me a blurb and was like, read this blurb and then read the sample pages. And the blurb made it sound like a basic, like fun rom com -y type. Uh, and it had like a cartoon cover type book, you know, and it's like, oh, this is going to be a fun rom com. And uh, open the sample pages. And it started the very first paragraph was a super graphic sex scene. Okay. Like super, like, I was like, Oh, and I'm not, you know, yeah, I had plenty of people. I am not easy to embarrass. And, but I was like, oh my goodness. And all I could picture was a, a relative of mine who, who reads fun rom-coms, but doesn't appreciate the, those kind of words. Yeah. Picking this book up in like a, a store and being like, oh, how cute. And then, you know, fainting in the aisle at the first three paragraphs. Well, so yeah, you that's gotta make sure selling somebody a box that looks like it's going to be a really beautiful elephant planter and they open the box and it's, you know, this big and you can't put anything inside of it. And right. yes. Like, yes. people get mad about that sort of thing. <laughs> so you want, you want your voice to match. You want the tone to match. You want the reader to, the whole idea of the blurb is for the reader to know what they're getting into. And I um, think that's part of why people struggle because you want it to accurately represent the book. And so that's where writers are like, oh, but that's why I have to tell them about grandma and about Auntie Claudine and about the pie. And and you don't. Um, yes. But I, I see why that happens. Secrets. Don't, don't lay everything out on the table for them. You want them to want to read the book. Right. And so you want to be sure that anything that you have as a big reveal in the book does not show up on the back cover copy because then it's like, oh. I already know what's going on and they don't go past that. Right. So you do want, um, and I see that there are a couple questions and we will absolutely address those in just a sec. Um, what you do want is for those couple preview sentences or even a couple paragraphs, if you're thinking it's going to be a little longer blurb because it just has to be, um, you must set up the conflict um, and the stakes so yes. that, and even if it's a fun rom-com, we need to know why Judy can't leave her personal shopper job 
um, without risking, you know, her fancy apartment or I don't, that was a really stupid example, but you know what I mean? Like <laughs> right. <laughs> we have to see that there's something on the line, that there is a question that must be answered and, and it has to be a good enough one. I mean, if it, if you've written a whole book and this is your conflict, then hopefully it's a pretty good conflict. You hint at it in your blurb to make readers go, Oh, okay. Like I, I that would be hard. I wonder how they'll figure that out. Right. right. You're the conflict queen. Well, and my thing is always conflict is based on choice. And so like we were talking about ending with your question, if your question's representing that conflict, then you need to be sure that the choice is in that question. And mm -hmm. if you don't end with the, the question, then um, if, for example, like with our, our more plot-based blurb or the preview story preview, the conflict is still there. Like in that um, blurb for Maze Runner, the conflict is still there of there were, it's been all boys. They don't remember anything. There's suddenly a girl and she's just telling them some weird stuff. So that conflict, even though it isn't set up of, can they choose between this and this, you know that they're already in an impossible situation. And you already know that people have tried to escape because it says that no one ever comes back alive. Right. So right. we know that they need to escape for some reason. So the stakes are there. Yeah. And literally life or death. Those are good stakes. Rom-com <laughs> doesn't have those as often. Yeah. <laughs> those are good stakes for a thriller or fantasy. Yeah. For rom <laughs> not so much. That's, that's usually not so much on that. It can be done. Um, I'm sure it has. Okay. And so just a quick nod to nonfiction. You must set up the conflict and the stakes there too. Um, in the example that we read, the stakes are stay in your paycheck to paycheck everyday life or potentially become a self-made millionaire. Those are good stakes, right? And and there's oh, your like Yeah. I mean, um, so you you want to create tension on the page, basically. Give give the reader some questions. Don't answer everything because you want in their mind for them to be going, well, so if this is a second chance romance, what happened the first time? Like where did she go? Mm -hmm. Why did she leave town so suddenly? That you want those kinds of questions not getting answered in your blurb. Hopefully right. that makes sense. Um, and then I did put here, leave on a question or a statement that begs resolution. So mm -hmm. I think that's the key to that, that question note that you made earlier. Um, it has to be something that the readers need answered and that isn't being answered in the blurb and that isn't yes. obvious. And then finally, what most people leave off of their blurb is the call to action, which is just standard sales best practice, ask for the sale. So give them an awesome blurb. And at the end of it, you want it to say, download or buy or pick up this hilarious romantic comedy today. Yes. Because um, that's what you want them to do. And believe it or not, it actually has an effect. Whether you use a sentence like that or not, you'll get a higher conversion if you do. Um, I've latched on to, to the phrase check out whenever I'm... Um, uh, like spreading words about new releases and that kind of thing. I find myself always saying, check out this new. <laughs> so well, I think writers are, are not typically very forceful, demanding types of people. And it's hard sometimes for us to say, buy this book. Um, so we end up shifting to words like, yeah, check out this book or, or give it a chance. Or, Take a look at it. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing wrong with the word buy. That's what you want them to do. Um, and then the very last note, because um, I've had this question before, is should you include an author blurb if you have one from, from an author friend maybe who is willing to give you some kind words about your book? Um, if the author is someone who is well known in your genre, then yes, absolutely. Um, Brian Cohen, who runs Best Page Forward and they do blurbs, um, I don't remember where I heard him say this, but it was a book bub study that he said, showed that um, with a with a well-known author that it was ads, I guess, they converted at like 22% higher if it had an author blurb from a well-known author. So I recommend putting that right up at the front if you do have one mm -hmm. before Definitely. you start your blurb. Well, and I wanna make sure that one of the points you made didn't get lost in there. It needs to be an author that is known in your genre. Yes. Because if you have a, you could have the greatest rom-com in the world. And if it has a blurb by Stephen King, I'm not picking it up. I don't because know. I don't do horror. Stephen King. <laughs> so, no. 
sure he's right. fascinating. I'd love to have a drink with him sometime. I don't want to read anything he's supporting because he terrifies me. <laughs> so you want to be, be sure that it's an author that similar readers would recognize. Yeah. The goal is basically to win their readers over to your book. So yes. let's see. Laura asked, is there a rule about writing the blurb in first versus third person or present versus past tense for conflicting opinions on whether the blurb needs to match the story? Yeah, you're going to get conflicting opinions here too, probably. Um, I think it depends. If all the blurbs in your genre right now are written in first person and that's what's selling, your blurb should be in first person, even if your book isn't. Um, I, I kind of hate that because I like things to line up, but I still think that that's the right answer. And in terms of a rule, um, it's whatever works for your story. I would say if you can match the blurb to the book, you should, because then readers know more what to expect. But if you have a third person story and you don't want to rewrite it into first person, just because that's kind of the trend right now, then just make your blurb in first person. Well, and I can say, I will say to you that as long as the blurb is good, I don't think I've ever read a blurb, bought a book, read the book and been like, okay, wait a minute, this is in first person and the blurb was in third or exactly. vice versa. I think it's the the blurb is just the, the hook. And so once you've got that hook, they're already into the story. And so I don't think most readers are going to take the time to go back and forth on that. Yeah. The blurb is just a moment in time, right? You want to just snag that sale and then probably they're not going to open the book and read it right this minute. Maybe they are. You want them to, they should. That would be fantastic, <laughs> but right. <laughs> Um, and then Susan says, this is the part where I struggle. I think she put this here when we were talking about the middle, the middle part, how much of the plot should I reveal without taking away all the mystery for the reader? So I don't know if we addressed that or not, Susan, I feel like we did kind of hit on that. That was probably me saying, uh, don't reveal all the secrets. Um, I recently was working with a client on a blurb and one of the main re in the first draft that she had created, one of the main reveals she had in the book, she would put in the blurb. And I was like, Oh no, 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 you can't No, You can't tell them this. They can't know this yet. This is, you know, right. and so, um, I think it's, I know it's hard. Like you were saying, because authors think, well, but they have to know everything. Remember all you're doing is giving them an appetizer. Right. You're, you're just showing them, hey, look, I know how to cook. So try this. The big meal's coming in a minute. Yep. So they're just getting a little bit. All right. And don't, don't give them the dessert first. <laughs> no. So I was just pulling up uh, Susan's blurb because it's sitting here in my email. Do you have it up? I'm about to. You, you start and I will pull mine up. Pull up my copy. You want me to read it? Sure. Okie dokie. Thank you again, Susan. Okay, here we go. So I believe this is, looks like Faye. So I'm going to say paranormal. I don't know anything else about the genre. Um, do you by any chance, Dawn? Um, yes, because I know that this book had a fabulous editor. <laughs> One second, I'm printing it off so I can read it while we're, um, yes, I, it, it is uh, um, fantasy. Okay, not romance. Yes, ro romantic. There's romance in the fantasy. Okay, very good. Susan's Susan nervous is. because we're like, <laughs> no, we're not going to <laughs> You're fine. It is okay. I'm going to be nervous. Okay. All right. So, are you, you don't want to read it or do you want me to? You read it. Okay. Death never ends when you are a fae. Okay, I'm going to read it. <laughs> read that sentence again, Don. Death, death never ends when you are fey. No, it says death is never the end when you are fey. Okay, we're gonna let Nancy read it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you do it live. <laughs> yes. I promise I can read. I do read every single day. I promise. Okay, go ahead. All right, you urban fantasy. Out. Out my glasses. <laughs> okay. Death is never the end when you are fey. Athena survives death, but at what cost? Her connection to the elements fading. She must keep the losts a secret. Whoever heard of a fey queen who couldn't control at least one element? Without those powers, she can't hope to save the fey realm and the North American Council at Enchanted Rock from the evil Calypso. 
Xander discovers a secret about his family that could change everything, maybe even the balance of power in the kingdom. Keeping the secret to himself until he can figure out the truth seems the right thing. He'll risk betraying Athena to keep her from dying again. Secrets come at a price higher than fey tears when love is on the line. Will Xander and Athena's love endure through the secrets they keep and Calypso's entrapment? Fae Redone is the second cl clan fey novella in the Enchanted Rock Immortals paranormal romance series. If you like fast-paced worlds filled with magic and raw emotions, you'll love Susan Person's fey adventures or any of the Enchanted Rock Immortals novellas. Mm. You read that very well. <laughs> Thank you. I was kind of excited about it. I like um, paranormal and fey. I'm reading a uh, Sarah J. Moss book right now that has a lot of like otherworldly things. Well, so you want to go first or you want me to shoot or? You go first. Blurbs are your thing. Okay. I have a couple initial thoughts. Number one, I like it. Um, I like that it is, I like the first line. It pulls you in. I know it's going to be um, a life or death kind of thing. And I know that we're talking about the Fae. So already if you're into Fae, then this would be something that would make you keep reading probably. Um, I like the setup of the stakes in the very first paragraph where she says um, that Athena's connection to the elements is fading, but that she has to keep that a secret because she can't hope to save the Fae realm without it. And then there's this evil Calypso. So I know we've also got like a bad guy at work. All of that is great. The place where I stumbled a little bit was the next paragraph because all of a sudden Xander discovers a secret about his family. And I don't know who Xander is um, or why I care about him. I was just hearing about Athena and all this awesome like council powers, elements kind of stuff. And I was super into that, but then Xander's here. So I think what I would recommend is introducing him through her perspective. Um, I don't know, maybe Don will have a, a better suggestion. I understand that he's our dual POV and that we need to know what's going on in his world as well and that these two um, fates are going to intertwine. But I think there's probably a little more finesse that could be used in introducing him here. Um, yes, I would, and I have the advantage of, I've edited both of the books, so I know what's going on here. I would, in uh, just exactly what you just said, of introduce Xander through Athena, as, but switch it just maybe a little bit of something like Xander saw Athena die in, and this is off the top of my head, so it's terrible, but Xander, something to, to make it clear that Xander saw Athena die and he's not willing to go through that ever again. But we don't know who he is. So I would want to know, I guess what I want to know is like, is Xander the love interest? I'm assuming yes, yes but I want to know that. Like, and so something like, Athena's mate Xander saw her die or uh, just a few words to tell us exactly who he is or how he relates to this character that we already know because we have so few words to use right we don't, we don't want to waste them in confusion um so if we need to know about Xander then introduce him through the lens of Athena and then I like I, I wasn't honestly crazy about the line, secrets come at a price higher than fey tears when love is on the line. Um, I understand what you're doing there, setting up the fact I that they're- That line either, I don't know if you can hear her back there. <laughs> no, she didn't, I heard the growl. Um, it, it's something, it, it almost sounds a little bit cliche, um, a price higher than fey tears and love on the line. It doesn't really tell me anything. Um, so would I, you just take that line completely out? Well, you know, words are gold in a blurb and you don't want to waste them if they're not delivering any value. So yeah, I would take them out. I would think about if there's something else I want to hint at in the plot that has to do with their love, um, if that's where we need to go for this next piece. And then the, the next part says, will Xander and Athena's love endure through the secrets they keep and Calypso's entrapment? So I would be tempted to use those words that we just decided to maybe get rid of to talk a little bit more about the, the conflict, the stakes, this Calypso person um, or bad guy, Faye or whoever Calypso is and what it is that that antagonist is trying to achieve and how Xander and Athena are set up to, to stop him or her. Um, do, does that 
strike a chord with you? Yes, definitely. Because Calypso is the big bad guy, but well, big bad girl, actually. Okay. And you can kind of figure that. Right. And so I think what is missing from this, which is a little bit hard for me to see because I know what happens. Um, I think what's missing from it is that we don't know what kind of threat Calypso is. Right. We know she's evil, but you don't know what her goal is. Is her goal just to, from reading this, is her goal just to pull Xander and Athena apart? Is her goal to destroy the entire kingdom? Is she going to turn everybody into frogs? What is she going to do? Exactly. So. Yeah. So I, I would think about taking that secrets come at a price higher, those words, and then maybe that next sentence too, and trying to work in a little bit more about the threat that Calypso poses and what Xander and Athena will have to possibly risk in order to stop her. Um, and then I like... I like that you're telling us it's the second novella, except that it makes me sometimes, I think it might stop a reader from buying because they'll be like, oh, wait, okay, this is the second. I should go buy the first then. And they may or may not get to the sales page for the first and actually you may or may not get the sale. So I don't think it hurts to put that maybe at the very, very end, or if you're going to say it, say that they're all standalones and, or if they must be read in order, then say that, um, or maybe don't. What do you think I would about say, that? I would say for this one, um, it's it's one that definitely will help you to read the first one. And so I, I would definitely want it on there somewhere that it is the second one in the um, series. I don't know that I would make that as the first line for the, the call to action paragraph, as you called it earlier. Yeah, because you're would, just using it. Right. And so I think having the um, the part of, if you like fast-paced worlds filled with magic and raw emotions, you'll love Susan Person's Fae Adventures and, or any of the Enchanted Rock Immortal novellas, and then adding that it's the second one somewhere after that. Yeah, you could even, I don't know how many books there are at this point, but you could even just in, in each blurb have the last thing be like a reading order or something. Right. If there's two or more books. Um, overall, I think this is really fantastic. It's very brief, which is great. Um, the problem that I see more often than not is just somebody tries to pack everything in there. And it's it's hard even as the blurb editor to figure out what's important and what's not. Um, so I, I think a tiny little bit of work here on the, the stakes and the antagonist and this one is ready to go. Good job, Susan. And thank you so much, Susan, for being brave. Yes. We appreciate it. We very much appreciate it. Um, well, and I wanted to point out too, because we had two very two differing point of views, because I'm familiar with this book and I've read the book and the book before it. So I kind of know the world and stuff. You're doing this completely blind because you haven't had any experience with any of this. Um, but one of the services that you do do is blurb writing mm -hmm. and can do that without having read the book. And so can you tell us a little bit about how you manage that without knowing the book? Yeah. And to be honest, like I said, I think it may be easier to write the blurbs without being too intimately familiar with the book because I have no allegiance to any one piece or part of the story. Does that make sense? So what I do is send a blurb info sheet um, that I ask the author to fill out. And because I work a lot in romance, um, I, I have two versions. I have a romance version and then a non-romance version. Um, and really I have you encapsulate for me in just a couple sentences, a, a few different things. Who are the main characters? What What is the goal motivation conflict for each of them? What are they trying, if it's romance, you know, what is each trying to achieve? What is keeping them apart? Um, what is their and initial meeting? What was that? And the what is keeping them apart is important because that usually feeds to your conflict. Right. And just because I'm asking for all these things does not mean I'm going to include them all in the blurb. But um, it gives me an idea of the setup of the book, um, what your, you know, like what, kind of what the tone is, where the setting is. Um, and then I ask for those comparative titles and I go look at those blurbs. And then I also ask, okay, look at a few books in your genre, whether they're, you consider them competitive or not, for which you really just like the blurbs. And then I go look at mm -hmm. those. Because if someone is looking for a really angsty, you know, tightly written, 
first person blurb and I deliver them, you know, a really poetic and soft third person thing, they're not going to be happy no matter what, even if it's a great blurb. So I try to do a good job listening to what the client wants and also matching what I think is going to sell well in their genre. Does that make sense? And then the, the process is really simple. I take a crack at writing it based on all this info. Um, I send it to you. You rip it apart. We usually go back and forth and track changes. I'll re-edit it. You mean the author. You don't send it to me. I don't you send, send it, it to the author. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretending like you're the author. I send it back to the author and say, okay, here's my first pass. What do you like? What do you not like? What's missing? What should I not be adding in here? Um, and it's a really collaborative process. So together we go through sometimes as many as five passes, usually closer to two or three um, to get something that they are really happy with. And hopefully that converts well. Well, and I want to say to you in that process, I do very little blurb work, but in that process, it's very important that you are honest about what you like and what you don't like. Oh yeah. Because this is what's selling your book. This is your face to the world for your book. And so if there's a phrase in there that doesn't sit right with you, or if you're like, they focused on this, but I really think that the focus of the conflict should be over here be very honest about that so that you can end up with a product that you are proud of. Right. And you don't hurt my feelings by saying, you know what, you're totally off the mark. This first pass is, it has nothing that I want. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't <laughs> happen, but um, it, you know, it's, it's a business, right? And our, our goal is mutual and that's to sell your book. So if, if I miss the mark, then we start again. It, it's not a personal thing for me. So you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, by coming back and saying, I, I don't like your suggestions, please try again. Um, All right. Yes, that's part of the process. Yeah. So, okay. all right. Do we have any other questions? We see um, Kelly has a question. If the reader needs to know, couldn't book two just be somewhere else on the cover and not in the blurb at all? Yeah. Um, yeah, because your cover may very well say book two. It, but in the um, thumbnail, you might not be able to see it. Right. That was going to be my point is if you're looking at this on Amazon, you're going to want that in the, the text part that the reader would read because a lot of times you can't read the whole, any detail on the um, thumbnail. Yeah. I think, although I'm hesitant to make it sound like you have to read book one before you can buy this awesome book. I, I think it plays into that giving somebody, you know, the beautiful box and then finding out that what's inside is not what they meant to buy you don't want to stumble into that. So somewhere on there, yeah, you, you, I think it needs to go in the text and not just on the cover. Yes. And Laura mm -hmm. says, is there any chance of getting a blurb checklist like the ones you provided for self-editing? Yeah, definitely. We can, I'll, I'll get that put together. It may look, I may just give you my blurb info sheet um, and a couple tips at the end. Maybe I'll, I'll sort of modify that so you can use the same process that I do. Um, when you're writing and if you run into a wall, just email us and we'll work it out. Okay. I think we covered a lot today. I think so too. We have exciting news because we've been scheduling things. I right? know I'm excited. Yes. Tell us, yes. You, you made a calendar for us. So tell us what's on. I, I did. I made a Google calendar that is shared. I'm so excited. Honestly, um, I, I, <laughs> I just <laughs> <shove up. laughs> It's not true, but I, I am very much the planner. And I promise that when I was making that Google calendar, I absolutely was not avoiding doing laundry. That was not what was going on at all. We needed that Google calendar. Um, so what we have coming up next week, we have uh, talking about doing a style sheet. And we're going to have James. And I'm excited because I've never met James. Well, um, I've only met James through... I, May have talked to him on the phone, but email, I think. So yeah, James Gallagher is one of our editors. Um, he focuses on copy editing, which a lot of people call proofreading. And he works for other publishing, like big publishing houses too. Um, and he's going to be, when he, when he finishes a copy edit, he delivers something called a style sheet along with his notes and changes. Um, and it's specific to every book that he edits. And then, so we're going to talk about that and how he does that and what why that's good. Um, 
And then we're also going to talk a little bit about style guides in general. Like I constantly am throwing out, well, Chicago says, um, because we in publishing use the Chicago manual of style. So he's going to talk a little bit about that stuff too, because that's really his, his world of expertise. Right. So we have that next week and I'm excited to meet James. Yep. And then the week after that, we have Melanie Harlow. Yay! Yes. And Melanie Harlow is awesome at, getting you invested in her characters and her setting and her stories in like two paragraphs or two sentences. Um, and it's like magic. So she's going to talk to us about how she does that. If she knows how she does that. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully she can share some. I told and her that's then, what we're talking about. So hopefully she's thinking about it. <laughs> and August 13th. Yes. We is our next guest. Can we announce that yet? Yes. Okay, and then August 13th, we have Sierra Simone. And that I'm just going to sit over here and fangirl for her and Melanie Harlow. I'm just going to sit in the background. But And she is talking about... The POV, your thing. My thing. Yes, I'm yeah. excited about it. So that's what we have coming up. We will have shows between um, Melanie and uh, Sierra. We just are shifting our topics around to make sure we can get all our guests in when we meet them. And then, of course, we have the classes on Teachable. And your discount is good still through the end of August or just until August? Until August 1st. Until so August. my POV class right now, if you use the code first class, it um, gives you a $30 discount, but that will end August 1st. Okay, good. The and class then will get the discount ends. <laughs> right. But that's like two more weeks still. Right. Yes, so there's plenty of time if you want to take it. It's self-paced, so you can get it now and not work on it until December if you want. But once you're in, you're in. Mm -hmm. And then there is the Elements of Romance class also, um, and the, there's a discount code on that one that will get you ten dollars off, um, and that's SS. Those are S's like Sam, and the number ten, and that is um, laying out basically a method of plotting a romance. So if you're looking for help with plotting romance, then that's a good one. And same thing, self-paced. So you can just go grab it and then take it when you have time. So that's what, going on. what else do we have? I think that's it. I think that's it for now. We've, we've been, we've got almost an hour today. We've got a long time. So thank y'all for staying with us. <laughs> Thanks yes. for hanging out. <laughs> well, it was fun. All right. Well, we'll say good, good night, I guess, depending on where you are. Um, and we'll see you again next week with James. All okay. Right. Bye.